Welcome to a GEMSEG Grand Lake Watershed Association webinar, recorded July the 16th, 2020. Our ability to do water quality monitoring, native tree planting on shorelines, and to provide educational videos such as this one depend upon donations from people like you. Your donation of any amount via Interact e-transfer to our email address will help us achieve our goal. If you have not already done so, consider joining our association as a member. You get access to native trees for planting on your shoreline and information about water quality, upcoming events, and opportunities for helping. To join us, please complete one of the membership forms and submit it with your membership payment of 10 Canadian dollars, renewable annually. The success of our organization depends on the efforts of our members. Our association bylaws require that all members submit a membership application form in writing. A clickable link to the forms is in the text below this video. Okay, it's uh, officially 8 p.m. I'm going to get started and um, first mention that uh, the webinar is being recorded as a video, but uh, note that no video or audio of the attendees will be recorded. Only the host and the speaker are being recorded. And this recording will be actually posted on a publicly available website uh, at a later time. So I'd like to welcome everyone. My name is Brad Nickerson and I am the president of the Gemsag Grand Lake Watershed Association. Our watershed covers 3,950 square kilometers, which is more than 5% of the area of the province of New Brunswick. Grand Lake at 271 square kilometers is the largest lake here uh, in New Brunswick and also the largest freshwater lake in the Maritimes. So if you are not already a member of our association, we would invite you to join. Memberships cost $10 per year and support our activities, including the organization and hosting of this webinar. You can contact us at our email address to receive membership information. You're, you should be able to see our email address on the screen. So we invite your questions this evening. I see we already have one. Um, please use the Q&A button that you see on your screen. This button will be used to post and also to uh, provide our presenter with the actual question. The chat session, chat session will just be used for identifying you and your associated uh, organization, if any, and your affiliation. So if you want a question and answer posted, please post it to the Q&A window. Uh, you can ask your questions uh, as we run through the entire webinar, uh, but Dr. Lawrence will answer your questions throughout the webinar or at the end, depending on the nature of the question. So please feel free and um, I'm going to be as host dismissing those that she has answered. So you will hear the answer when it comes up. Uh, right, now we're gonna have a, a quick poll. Uh, the poll will actually ask um, some questions of you and you will have four choices in the poll. If you should, could just quickly answer one of the provided answers uh, one of the questions, answer one of the questions as it appears on your screen, just click one answer. And as soon as we get um, enough answers, we will provide the actual results of that poll to the attendees. So I'll wait uh, a few seconds here till hopefully most of you can answer the question about cyanotoxins on the quick poll. I see we have quite a few already answered. Hopefully most of you can see it and answer the poll. 
All right, we're at 45 seconds in. I'll give another 10 seconds if you wouldn't mind trying. There's a few remaining people who haven't uh, to answer the question. That would be much appreciated. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll and share the results. And you should be able to see the results uh, showing most people, just over 50% indicate They've heard of cyanotoxins, but don't know how they work. And eight people, 19% know how they work, and a few have heard of them, but I don't know how they work, how they, uh, what they are even. And it's good that to know that some people, low, most people have heard of the cyanotoxins. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing that little poll result. And Resume the share of my screen. Right, so now we have a little sense of the background of our audience. And um, so now we're gonna proceed to uh, introduce our speaker. Our speaker this evening is Dr. Janice Lawrence. She completed her Bachelor of Science in Marine Biology and her PhD in Biological Oceanography at Dalhousie University. Her PhD thesis investigated the source and dynamics of algal toxins in cultured shellfish. She completed a postdoctoral fellowship at UBC studying the role of viruses in phytoplankton ecology and received an NSERC University Faculty Award to join UNB in 2003. Janice is currently examining the distribution of toxin producing cyanobacteria in New Brunswick water bodies using genetic tools. Janice also serves as the Associate Dean of Science at UNB. So I'll turn it over to Janice. Thanks so much for, um, for coming out tonight, uh, or sitting at home, I guess, um, and uh, joining a little bit of information about cyanobacteria in New Brunswick. So thanks so much for the introduction. And also thanks for the opportunity to, uh, to chat with everyone about what I've been looking at for the last few years. As Brad introduced, um, my background is actually in marine biology and oceanography, but uh, having been a New Brunswick resident since 2003, I've been watching a, an increase in awareness and concern about fresh waters in New Brunswick. We have, the reason I moved here was actually for the lakes and for the river. And so um, I noticed that the same issues were rising around the world and started to wonder if some of the tools that I was using to study marine systems might be applicable and useful for studying freshwater systems. And so I started uh, kind of on this. I've got uh, a little bit of new information on my belt and some new tools and techniques that uh, we're using to sort of probe some of the waters in New Brunswick. So instead of waiting to the end, I wanted to acknowledge some of the people that have been really fundamental in uh, developing this research program and working with me. Um, a colleague at UNB, Andrew, Adrian Reyes Precho, um, works alongside with me and his lab as well, um, doing a lot of this work. And I've been really fortunate to have a really strong team of undergraduate researchers working with me. Um, who've contributed a huge number of hours and collected a lot of the data that I'm going to show today. So where we all want to start off, uh, what I'm going to run through today, here are some of the goals of this talk. Um, first, I'd like to start off by providing a background. I see a lot of you have an idea what cyanotoxins are, but may not be sure about how they work. I'm not going to go too much into the details of their physiology, their effect on humans, but a little bit of that, but it sort of explain the major toxins that we may see around New Brunswick. I'm then going to introduce some of the methods that I've been developing to, to try to gain, gather a little more information on New Brunswick water bodies and share very summer, you know, sort of overview summaries of some of the data that I've collected to date. And at the very end, um, I'd like to just take a few minutes to discuss what it means to mitigate and what means we have to mitigate cyanobacteria proliferation. So accumulations, dense accumulations of cyanobacteria that we're starting to see in some of our water bodies. And also have a chance to talk about what we can do to reduce the risks of toxicity uh, when we engage in our, our water bodies. As I said, I, I very much moved to New Brunswick to enjoy the, the amazing 
uh, fresh water bodies we have here. And uh, although at times you may hear what I'm saying today sounds a little scary, uh, rest assured, I still go out and play in the water. And uh, the important thing is really understanding what there is out there um, before we before we engage. So, uh, Janice, Janice, could I interrupt yes. you for a second? Uh, most yep. of us, most of us are seeing uh, the presenter view of the slides, where the notes and the time spent is shown. Oh, that's and weird. Not the actual slide present, like the full okay. slide presentation. I don't know if it's easy to change that. But. I'm going to give it a try. I'm going to try swapping displays again. It seems to there seems to be a little bit of a. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's better. Is that it? And it, if I move my Q and A off there, then. Does that work better? Yeah, that's better. Thank you. Okay, that's good. Thanks for telling me because the uh, text is going to start getting small if you're looking at the presenter view there. Yes, thanks for changing. Okay, thanks Brad. Okay, so we'll start off with a little bit of a background on what cyanobacteria are um, and then talk about the toxins. So they're actually a very large group of organisms and they are indeed bacteria. Um, the one thing that separates them from all the other bacteria that you might have heard of, bacteria that you find in your gut, or bacteria that you might find uh, working in biotech industry, for example, is that these ones are photosynthetic. So they're capable of harvesting the sunlight energy um, and synthesizing life compounds using the sun's energy. And so that's the only thing that sets them apart from the other bacteria. They are also very small cells and they are also, they live in lots of environments. Cyanobacteria in particular, unlike bacteria, which you can find pretty much anywhere, they're water associated, um, but they don't have to live in a huge amount of water. We can find them in huge diverse habitats associated with even very small films of water. So some examples of some of the places you might not think you would find cyanobacteria are this polar bear. They're actually, cyanobacteria living in the hollow hairs of a polar bear often and they just get their water when the polar bear goes for a swim. You can find cyanobacteria here on the underside of a quartz rock that um, the rock actually does a brilliant job of um, reflecting, refracting light right onto the cyanobacteria and they have a nice wet surface on the soil to grow on. And finally, what you might see on the right hand side here, this is a lichen. And a lichen is an association between a fungus and a cyanobacteria. It's the cyanobacteria that give it that nice red tipped color and the deep green blue color as well. So we see cyanobacteria absolutely everywhere. We often hear cyanobacteria being referred to as blue green algae, and they are actually really distinct from being algae. And I'll get to in a couple of slides to explain why it's important we keep them separate. But first, I'm going to explain how they're different from algae. So if we were to take all the organisms on the planet and throw them onto one great big family tree, we would have a tree like this that I have up in my slide. If we could take everything there is and the tree, now in this case, unlike a family tree you might see in a genealogy book, um, we start in the center here and radiate out rather than starting on the left or on the top. All organisms can be placed on this tree and they are grouped according to how closely related they are to one another. So the bottom half of the tree here, you'll see two groups in green and purple. They're called archaea and bacteria. All of these are cells that are made up in a very similar manner. These are all unicellular organisms. They're all very simple, small cells. They don't have any internal organelles. They don't have hairs or uh, mitochondria, if you've heard of those, or chloroplasts for doing photosynthesis. And in the middle here, you'll see this little guy, cyanobacteria. So the cyanobacteria are at home with amongst all of these other single cells that we call prokaryotes. The other half of the, the tree of life is formed of cells called eukarya. These are eukaryotic cells and they are much bigger cells. And the organisms that are built with them tend to be much bigger. You can see here that we've got the fungi, the animals, slime molds, land plants like trees, and you'll notice green algae and red algae. So when we talk about algae, these are the organisms we're talking about. They have very large cells. Inside the cells, they have lots of complex components, but we often confuse them with cyanobacteria, for one, because they live in the same environment aquatic environments. 
but also because they have the same color, they're capable of doing photosynthesis. And it's actually no real surprise now that we've figured out how plants got their capability of doing photosynthesis, that they look so similar and are confused. Take a look back down here in the bacteria plot. You'll notice a note here, plastids including chloroplasts, right beside cyanobacteria. So what we have are eukaryote cells, land plants and green algae that have a tiny organelle inside them, the chloroplast that does photosynthesis, and it is closely related to cyanobacteria. Why? Well, we now know that the way the very first organisms got the ability to do photosynthesis was that here is a non-photosynthetic organism. It took in, ate a photosynthetic cyanobacteria, and instead of digesting it and breaking it down into its small parts, it maintained that chloroplast and kept it functioning to do photosynthesis. And so all of our land plants, algae, they are all basically big cells that have cyanobacteria inside them. And so they lead, leads to a lot of confusion. Cyanobacteria are ancient. They were the original chloroplast that gave rise to photosynthesis for everything else. And we actually see like this picture here on the bottom right, we can find fossil cyanobacteria dating back as far as 3.8 billion years. So they have been on the planet a huge length of time and there's absolutely no reason to fear them. In fact, we wouldn't have the environment that we have today if we didn't have cyanobacteria. When they photosynthesize, a byproduct, basically their waste, is oxygen. And because there have been so many cyanobacteria photosynthesizing over billions of years, we have an oxygen atmosphere. So humans wouldn't actually be able to exist in their current form if it weren't for cyanobacteria doing photosynthesis. So it's a really important point to realize that where they fit and how they're actually really important for us. So why is it that we get really concerned about them? We'll get to that in a second. The other reason we want to keep them separate is that they have very different um, abilities in the environment and therefore they're triggered by different things. And you can see where I'm leading. If we want to avoid some cyanobacteria, we have to, do, we have to consider their unique physiology and their unique lifestyle habitat to get rid of them. And they don't have the same lifestyle and habitat as algae. So in this picture here, I've got two different cells. One is a typical algal cell at the top and a typical cyanobacteria, a little artist's rendition. So first of all, you'll notice that they have very different sizes. Algal cells host all sorts of small organelles inside that have to be there, and uh, they tend to grow a lot bigger. What this does is re results in a very high, or low for uh, eukaryotic algae, surface area to volume area. If you take a look at the cyanobacteria cell on the bottom, it's small. And there is no point inside that cyanobacteria that is very far from the external environment. What that means is that anything that needs to get in, say nutrients or important compounds that it needs to live, don't have to travel very far to go from the external environment and get inside and help the cyanobacteria grow. In the case of the green algae though, anything that needs to be taken in, whether it's nitrogen or phosphorus or trace metals and vitamins that they require, those compounds have to travel a great distance across into the center of the cell and they also have to cross all sorts of different membranes the whole way there. And this therefore means that the cyanobacteria are much more able to do things like rapidly take up nutrients and adjust to environments relative to their algal counterparts. It also means they can then grow really rapidly um, and take over environments really quickly. The second thing that, that makes them really different, unlike green algae that obtain all of their nutrients from the external environment um, in a very specific form, cyanobacteria can take in nutrients in rather peculiar forms. So green algae, like other land plants, love nitrogen and phosphorus in the forms of nitrate, phosphate, nitrite, ammonia, the sorts of things you'd put on your lawn to fertilize it. There's a huge source of nitrogen that no green algae or other plants use. It's the nitrogen in the air. 
our atmosphere has 78% nitrogen in it, and it's completely unusable to any of the other green plants on the planet. Cyanobacteria, are, a lot of them, are capable of taking that huge source of nitrogen and using it as a fertilizer source to grow. We call this nitrogen fixation. It simply means fixing the nitrogen from an unusable form, an organic, inorganic form, into a usable form. Cyanobacteria are also capable of very strong vertical migrations, meaning they can move in the water column and they can adjust how uh, deep they are depending on their needs. So they may need more light and change their buoyancy to move to the surface, or they may find there's nutrients low and they adjust their buoyancy to drop down. Green algae and other algae aren't capable of, typically aren't capable of such large vertical migrations, and it means that they are sort of wherever the wind and the currents take them and less able to uh, really capitalize on the environment that they're in. The other thing about cyanobacteria that sets them apart of the algae, and this is more specifically speaking to those that we would find in the temperate environments in New Brunswick, for example, is that cyanobacteria do famously well at growing in really warm temperatures. The algal communities that you typically find in a temperate lake, like we would have around New Brunswick or anywhere across Canada, are going to be adapted to grow maximally under 25 degrees. Cyanobacteria don't hit a threshold and really slow down as much the same way that the, the algae do. Above 25, we see depressed growths of, of a lot of the different um, algal community that you'd find in freshwater lakes. Cyanobacteria quite like it and they can grow very rapidly. And so what of all these unique bits of physiology result in is sometimes cyanobacteria really overtake uh, environments and that we refer to as a bloom. The bottom right hand picture here you can see a very bright slick um, blue-green discoloration and that is what we would call a cyanobacteria bloom. The term bloom simply means something has gotten to a really high density. These are visible features and um, they can lead to a bit of a smell when they start to decompose and they concern people for good reason because people don't know what they are and what, they're so, what might, else might be lurking underneath. Um, the blooms in and of themselves, besides being um, sort of unsightly and possibly causing some scents and some, like some odors and some um, uh, flavors in water, for example, the blooms can also contain toxins. And in fact, cyanobacteria can contain toxins whether they're found in a bloom or not. And that's where people are really concerned. So blooms are separate from toxins. The most um, cyanotoxins we group according to their, basically their effect on humans. We're really anthropocentric about that. And so we class them according to the organ that they impact on a human. So we call, one group of the toxins are called dermatoxins because they affect our skin. There are a couple of them and they're produced by just a couple of different genera. So the species, I guess. There's also a group called hepatotoxins and these affect the liver. I won't go into the details of why, but essentially the toxins interfere with the digestive enzyme process in our liver. And so the more toxins you ingest, they interfere with that process. A lot of times the first signs of hepatotoxin um, toxicity are uh, indigestion, um, gastro issues, that sort of thing. There are th at least three different major groups of hepatotoxins, and they can be produced by a number of different cyanobacteria. The final class of toxins are called neurotoxins. These impact the nervous system, and there are a number of different types, and in fact, it's actually quite complicated within each of these groupings I've listed, such as anatoxins. There are many variants within anatoxins. This is a grouping of a toxin type. The, all of these neurotoxins can be produced by a large number of different types of cyanobacteria. And one of the new ones, a BMAA, it's called, we think that they're probably can produced by pretty much all cyanobacteria. So this is why people get worried when they hear about cyanobacteria. It's not because all cyanobacteria are a problem. In fact, only a very few of the thousands of cyanobacteria species out there can actually produce these toxins. In uh, North America, the most 
commonly found toxins are the microcystins and the anatoxins. And so we're, um, they're the most frequently found. Um, microcystins, your liver toxin, they um, are found in a lot of lakes, uh, but not just in North America, also around the world. Anatoxins are not as frequently um, screened for. Um, there haven't been as many reports until recently of anatoxin poisoning. And so it's not one that you'll, you'll hear as much about. Usually when you're hearing about um, toxicity, you're, you're hearing about microcystins. And so these are the two toxins because I, uh, when I jumped into this cyanobacteria world, I understood that microcystins and anatoxins were the biggest concern in North America and the most, most common to be found when people were looking. And this is where I decided to, to start look, looking as well in New Brunswick. So because people are concerned about cyanobacteria possibly having toxins in our freshwater environments, they use a number of different strategies to try to monitor for them. So to be aware of if they're going to pick up in number, are they present and could they cause any problems? And there's a lot of different ways of doing that. One of the neat things about cyanobacteria, even though they very much make up the component that gives photosynthetic capability to algal cells, they have a unique pigment that are, is not found in algal cells. And it means that we can actually detect cyanobacteria distinctly from other algae in water bodies. And so this is employed by um, areas that can have massive blooms, like you see this Lake Erie, which pretty much annually has very large blooms of cyanobacteria, and you can see them from the satellite because of this unique pigment, and it's the pigment that allows them to harvest the sun's energy. So this is a great approach for covering very large areas, um, but it doesn't tell you a lot about what's going on in local, like in, in you know, right on the edge of your shore of your cottage. Um, and it really doesn't tell you who is causing the, possibly causing the toxicity or anything more. A lot of people also rely on microscopy or cell counts. So taking, here's a picture of me out sampling um, one of the lakes and if you can see where my hand is, there's there, the, the cyanobacteria there are so abundant that you can actually uh, see them with your naked eye, but um, those are clumps of cyanobacteria together. You still need a microscope to get down and see these individual cells to get close to making an identification. Um, the cells themselves are only about one micron in size, but the clumps can be a couple of millimeters to even like a, a fistful clump, so they can really get quite big. So with microscopy, you can actually get an idea of how abundant they are and who is actually there. So that instead of just tracking cyanobacteria in general, you can look for the species that may be associated with toxins. And this is what's done in New Brunswick. And so this is how um, the, the cyanobacteria advisory, which is referred to as a blue-green algal advisory, that's how this it's done. Basically, when um, a visible bloom is sighted, Samples can be taken by the Department of Environment and Local Government, and they will send it out for microscopy examination to determine what particular species are present. If a potentially toxic species is detected, then an advisory is listed for that area, and you'll notice that it just, all of them say the date to present. And that's because once you see cyanobacteria in an area, they don't go away they overwinter, they have basically, they put down sort of seed beds and they can come back at any time. So it would never be safe to remove any of these water bodies off of the list because they could bloom at any point in time. The challenge with both of these methods is they don't actually tell you if the cyanobacteria that are present are producing toxins. And there are so many different species of cyanobacteria that don't produce toxins that, that um, it's kind of helpful to have an idea of uh, whether or not they're actually a threat. And so there's a few different approaches that have been used in different places. Um, if you're familiar with cyanobacteria research, you probably have heard of immunological and biochemical assays. So this is basically using an antibody that binds to the toxin. If the antibody binds, you know you have a toxin there. If there's no binding, there's no toxin. That works really well for known toxins, um, but it, they, they don't talk, detect them all the same way. And the other approach is called physical chemical. This is looking for the physical chemical properties of the toxins. And it involves uh, mass spectrometry or liquid chromatography bound mass spectrometry. 
these are really expensive and very difficult um, to operate. And so there are no local facilities that will be able to run this for, for routine analysis. Um, we're getting a lot of our data sort of ground truth tested um, to see if there are actually toxins and things that we're detecting. And uh, I can tell you it costs a lot of grant money to get that done. So the other challenge with both of these methods, whether or not you're using an antibody to detect the toxin, or you're using a big machine to detect the toxin is the toxin's already there. You've had no warning. You've had no um, time to see it build up. You have to wait until the, the toxin is abundant enough to detect. So there's another approach that people are starting to use in a whole bunch of different fields, and it's what I have been using to study marine environments um, for other purposes. And this is why I decided that maybe I would try applying some of the techniques to looking at cyanobacteria and it's to look for the genetic capability of toxin production. We call this a PCR. So essentially every living cell has inside it, in every one of our cells, the complete instructions to carry out absolutely anything that we are going to do in our entire lifetime. And so those instructions are called DNA. And that's also referred to as our genetic code. It's our code that tells us how to do everything that our cells need to do, get oxygen, process sugar, and so if a cell is capable of producing toxins, it has to have a genetic code for toxin production. That code would be called a toxin gene. An individual piece of the whole genetic code is called a gene. So cyanobacteria, here's my little drawing of one. Uh, this is a little cell and it has this big long molecule inside it, DNA. That's what we would refer to as its genetic fingerprint. It tells us what this thing is capable of. Unfortunately, looking for the toxin gene in that whole DNA swirl is literally looking for a needle in a haystack. It's one small gene out of a huge pile of DNA. And then imagine trying to find that one gene in all cells DNA in an entire liter of water. So what we do in order to be able to detect the gene is we exponentially amplify it using a reaction called PCR. So essentially what we have here, this is the, the string of the DNA, and there is a target interest here, the big red thing, and that is the gene that gives the cell the capability of producing toxin. And there is only a single copy at the very beginning of the reaction, but we go through an exponential amplification in the end, what we have is we've swamped the sample, it's full of the toxin gene. We then run the entire sample on a long column here, we run all of the DNA found from an entire liter of water down. And what we see, this is our standard on the side, is right at the size that we would expect the toxin gene to be, there's a great big plug of DNA in one sample. The sample next door, there's absolutely nothing there. And so this is the, the basis of the methods that I'm using, is whether or not we have a positive or a negative for the gene to produce the toxin. It's not saying the organism is producing the toxin, it's saying that they have the capability. It means they can turn that capability on at any time if they don't currently have it turned on. And so that's the method that we'll be talking about through the rest of the talk. So because um, microcystins are by far the most abundant toxin found in other regions across Canada, we decided to start with detecting microcystin genes. As a quick reminder, it's a liver toxin, so we call it a hepatotoxin. Um, it means that in a lot of cases, we think it's underreported. People may um, think they've had too much to drink because their stomach got upset, or they just think they have a stomach bug. And it may actually be that they have been exposed to microcystins when they were um, drinking water from a lake that they didn't uh, filter, or um, ingesting a lot of water while swimming, that sort of thing. There are quite a number of producers of microcystin, which makes it really complicated and difficult. You'd need to, each one of these names is kind of like the last name. So it's a very large family of organisms. And then there's species within them. And there are, I think, 500 species of Anabaena, Dilucospermum, multi hundreds of microcystis. And you would need to try to um, figure out which ones of those might be producing toxins. The other real challenge that I didn't explain when I was talking about the microscope method is there is no 
single, there's no feature on a cell that says it's toxic. You can have two cells side by side. They are the same species. One of them has a toxin gene and one of them doesn't. And there is no coloration difference. There's no bump or thorn or horn on the cell. There's no way to identify a toxic cell uh, and separate it from a non-toxic cell. And so this is what really muddies things for detecting these cells. Fortunately, people before us had done a lot of work to figure out what is what information is required to be in the, in the DNA of a cell to produce toxins. So they know that there's actually a number of different genes. You're not gonna have to memorize this. But what we're looking at here is on the top left, we have a very small molecule that is modified step after step after step to produce this big one at the bottom, and that's the toxin. People have figured out that there's individual genes listed at the top here, MCYG, MCYD, and so forth, that moderate each of these steps. And so in order to go from a simple phenylpropanoid at the beginning to the microsystem toxin, you have to have all of these genes in your genetic hardware. And so it turns out that MCYE, one of the genes in that whole pathway, or one of the steps, is absolutely critical. And it, if organisms possess this gene, they are very likely to be producing, do, have all the other genes and actually be producing toxins. And so this was a perfect target for us, a place to look where we could look for an individual gene. If it's present, we know there's a really good chance that cell is, can and will produce toxins at some point. Um, and it avoids us having to go through a whole lot of other um, expensive chemical tests. So we basically took this approach and used it, uh, first tested it um, on a couple of lakes around New Brunswick where we knew from the advisory list there were cyanobacteria blooms um, and where there had also been a bit of follow-up with some of the chemical toxin tests. So we knew there was a good chance of finding toxins there just in order to get methods working. And so I'm not going to go into all of the nitty gritty details where of all of the lakes, we've done about through four, lake, four different years worth of studying, but I thought I would highlight some of the work we did from 2019. We're just getting ready to publish this and we should be able to, um, I'm hoping to have it out by the end of the year. And so what this is, is a summary of what I call MCYE presence. I don't wanna say it's microcystin toxin presence, this is not what I've measured, but what lakes have the gene? In them and therefore could produce toxins and therefore we should keep an eye on. We were able to, we had a huge help from different watershed organizations that provided us with samples regularly throughout the whole summer because we had no idea even what season to look for these genes in. So we were able to get uh, 11 lakes sampled regularly. Unfortunately nine of them actually came back positive to, for MCYE. They weren't positive all the time, and we don't know, I want to caution you, we don't know how abundant that gene was yet. That's something we're working on. But certainly there is the potential for in, in a, uh, more lakes in New Brunswick than not, uh, of the, those we tested, for the toxin to be present. To give you an idea of um, how frequent a sample comes back positive, 36 out of 80, so awfully near half of the samples that we received were positive for the MCYE gene. However, we don't know if there was maybe a single copy out of billions of cells or millions of copies. That's actually something that we're working on now. Um, and we, unfortunately, we've been slowed down a little bit uh, because of the, COVID, the pandemic. We can't get access to the, some of the instruments that we would normally use, um, but that's something that we are working towards is quantitative. Um, we found we were a bit surprised. We often hear of blooms happening right now. I can tell you I was vacationing on a lake last week, tried to get away from work, went down to the shore and I looked down and there they were. They'd come to find me. Um, and then this is very common, really hot weather. We start to see cyanobacteria. They love that above 25 degrees Celsius temperature. But when we see the toxin gene most commonly present so far has been in September. Um, the second most common uh, toxic month or potentially toxic month would be August. And actually July didn't have so much um, for the toxin genes. 
keep in mind this is actually just data from 2019 we would need a lar longer picture to know if this is representative of, of multiple years or if this is just a single year sighting um, we worked on a we have an, an assay that allows us to, to determine who contains the gene, not just if the gene is present, which has been really helpful. And uh, we've been able to not narrow it down that basically uh, anytime we find the toxin gene present, it is associated with the genus Microcystis. And so we do have other genera blooming <clears throat> into huge populations in other lakes around the province. But so far, my data is showing that those ones, they're blooming and they may produce toxins elsewhere, but our local cells don't have the capability. So there might be some good news stories if we can get this method working more and, and apply it a little more widely. <clears throat> Up until um, just a couple of years ago, microcystin was the, really the big um, concern across Canada. And we had assumed that we might stop there. I thought this was going to be a nice little summer project. And then <laughs> we all probably heard an awful lot about, if you're sitting in this seminar, about a number of dog deaths that occurred along the Woolastook River. Um, I refer to it as the Woolastook. It's also, people also refer to it as the St. John River, a uh, river that runs through the entire province of New Brunswick from Edmonston right through, through to St. John. And so this was a, a toxicity um, that occurred actually over, for like, in two, two separate years. The first year in 2018, there were three dogs who passed away very rapidly after playing along the shores of the Wollaston River. And in 2019, another dog passed away also from playing along the shores of the river. And so I was working on microcystin toxin and thought that that was going to be, you know, a really helpful thing. And suddenly I needed to do a bit of a 180. And the reason being that um, the samples were sent away for analysis at the National Research Council and what was determined right away was that the dog deaths were due to something called anatoxin A. And this is a compound that was very first isolated in Canada. It was associated with some livestock deaths um, out west on, in an, an agricultural um, uh, irrigation pond. The toxin was first called the very fast death factor because it does cause death so rapidly. It's um, the way its mode of action, it's a neurotoxin and it binds to the neurotransmitters that control the muscle function. And so what ends up happening is all the muscles responsible for breathing, the diaphragm, they stop working. And so very rapidly, if you've had uh, enough of a dose, um, you will end up with uh, paralysis, suffocation, and, and death from the toxin. There are a number of producers that have been recorded elsewhere around the world. Um, you'll maybe recognize some familiar genera from previous slides. Um, and so no one had any idea that the, the auto the necropsies from the dogs came back saying that they had a, the cyanobacteria toxin, anatoxin in them but no one had any idea where it could have come from. The reason being, the river looked clear. There were no blooms, there was nothing visible, there was nothing that looked that blue-green, catch it with a satellite, obvious discoloration that anyone would have been worried about. So what we started doing is, is looking around to see if there was possibly another source of anatoxin along the river. And what we found were not blooms, there, you know, no one made any, <laughs> there's no question on that. But what there was was benthic and epiphytic mats. So benthic refers to bottom attached mats. Epiphytic, epi means on and phytic is uh, plant material. So these are, here we go, a mat that's living on top of an aquatic plant. And we found these in high abundance in the areas that the dogs had been playing and had passed away. So we brought some back to the lab and started playing with it to see what we could discover in terms of um, potential toxicity. When we looked under the microscope, we saw that indeed there were a huge number of cyanobacteria there. Instead of the single cells, like I showed you at the beginning, 
each of these cells, they're like little um, bricks here, are attached together in very long filaments. And so these filaments form um, a mesh type scum and they can, um, like a web, and they can be attached to rocks, they can weave their way through muds, they can be on top of cobbles and rocks or weave their way around, around aquatic plants. We um, are fortunate again that previously other biotoxin researchers had also determined the suite of genes that's required to produce anatoxin. Much like I showed you before, there are a number of different genes, so they're called ana I, J, A, and they're all in a row inside the genetic material of some cyanobacteria cells, and they work together to take the starting molecule, which is an amino acid called proline, if you're interested, and go through a series of steps, each moderated by a, the product of one gene, to produce a potent neurotoxin. Once again, we were able to um, capitalize on there being one gene in the entire pathway that seems to be absolutely critical if an organism is going to be able to produce anatoxin or one of its relatives, homoanatoxin, it's going to have the ANA C gene in it. And so we had been hoping, and it, before we even knew about dog deaths, we knew that the next most common toxin in Canada is anatoxin. And we'd hoped to develop an assay, but unfortunately we weren't able to obtain any material to develop an assay with. Um, we didn't know of any local anatoxin after the dog deaths, uh, unfortunately. Um, we did end up with a lot of material and we were able to develop a genetic assay, I get it working really quickly. So I've got some results from 2019. What we ended up doing then is um, in order, after the first dog death of 2018, we did identify these clumps of material in the bottom of the river and we wanted to spend some time in 2019 figuring out where those clumps came from. A lot of them were just floating by, washing up on the shore, but we had no idea how much there was, where it originated from, and what it looked like in its natural habitat. So we worked with the Canadian Rivers Institute. They uh, did a sampling um, strategy covering the region where the dog deaths had occurred. Um, the region, if I've got a map, it's flipped on the side here so that it'll line up with my chart next. Just to orient you here, at the top, this is the Mactaquac Dam, so the head pond is stretching up above. The St. John River flows down here. There are a number of islands, we call them back channels. And down here at the bottom is Fredericton. So there's the south side of Fredericton on the left and the north side on the right hand side. And the dogs had passed away, one of them at site eight, that's the Carlton um, boat launch in Fredericton on the north side. And dogs had also passed away playing in the water up near site four. That is um, the Hart Island area. And later, another dog in 2019, a dog passed away after playing just off the, uh, the 102, just sort of a little down from, from site four. So the Canadian Rivers Institute sampled these eight sites every two weeks for the entire summer, looking for anything that could be cyanobacteria-like, and we screened it using a genetic assay, looking for the toxin gene and having really no idea if we'd find it anywhere and what we were looking for. So we were pretty shocked when this is what turned out. What we've got here are the sites going down river, so up from the Mactaquac Dam right through down to Carlton Park. And across the top is the timeline. We were sampling as early, we had a bad flood that year, we couldn't get on the water safely until early June, right through to the end of September. And there's some summary, um, oops, sorry. There's some summary information here on the, on the columns. What you'll see right away looking at the summary data is that the toxins were present all the time and at most of the sites. So throughout June, our very first time coming out, seven of the eight sites were positive. That's what this number means. Some days, eight out of eight sites were positive, eight out of eight, or seven out of eight, eight out of eight. And they only started to decrease by the end of September when only half of the sites were still positive for the toxin gene. Um, in terms of location, basically the entire region 
with site number one up at the near the Matiquac Dam was positive from June right through to September. Some other locations, back channel areas, site two, you can see it's um, not in the main flow of the Willistook, was only positive four out of eight times. Another site that's in a back channel here, site five, was also only positive five out of nine times. But every other site was positive most of the time. So we pretty quickly last year realized that this was an extensive, um, an, an organism that was found extensively in the area. And um, we started to know what exactly we were looking for. And so this is what cyanobacteria on the bottom of the river looks like. Um, much harder to detect and much more camouflaged. So we refer to these as benthic mats or bottom mats. Some people will still refer to it as a bloom because it is a rapidly growing proliferation of cyanobacteria, but it's not floating on the surface. This one is photosynthesizing rapidly. You can see all sorts of bubbles of oxygen being produced as the byproduct of photosynthesis. And that actually becomes really important because what we noticed over the summer was as this mat covered more and more rocks across the bottom, we ended up with sites that were 80, 90% of the rocks on the bottom of the river were covered with a, a solid film of cyanobacteria. And once it got established, it got thicker and thicker and thicker. And as we had sudden storm events with large pulses of fresh water ripping through down the river, or really, really sunny, warm days with lots of photosynthesis causing bubbles and ballooning to happen, these mats started to move. So those were the two things that we were able to recognize from being on the river was there were a couple of different things that would cause what we call mat erosion. So lifting of mats and pushing them down with the flow. For sure, changes in peak flow. Um, so right after big, the big thunderstorms we have and huge pulses of water coming through the sewer system, we, we uh, storm sewer system, we end up with seeing mats rip off the bottom. And also, um, when the, the water starts getting really warm, long, lots of long, hot days, we see lots of bubbling and mats starting to lift off. So those have become pretty critical points to look for. We Here's some other pictures of what the mats can look like. They're very camouflaged. Walking by, you would probably not think twice about it. I certainly didn't until a year ago. So in this picture on the left, we've got a long, mat that's kind of stretched out, attached in parts and starting to lift off. And there are rocks, cobbles at the bottom of the screen here um, that are completely covered with the mat. Once they lift off, they look like this on the right hand side. They look like just a, a clump of sort of muddy scum floating down the river. Um, at times last year, the surface of the Willistook was, you, you, you wouldn't be able to swim across the river without bumping into an awful lot of these. Um, they just littered the whole surface of the river and uh, there was sort of a massive liftoff event and we would then at that same time find a huge amount of this material washed up on the shore. And so having the Department of Environment and local government had responded so quickly to the dog deaths, had interviewed the owners and knew that the dogs were eating material on the shore and collected some of the material and had tested and knew that it looked like this sort of dried up material. Um, and that's what it originated from, material from the bottom that erodes up, floats down and can end up littered along the shore anywhere. Um, one of the particularly challenging things for dog owners with respect to this type of a cyanobacteria accumulation is some cyanobacteria produce a compound that actually attracts dogs. It's called geosmin. And it's a scent, it's a musky scent in my, in my mind, um, but it seems to be very attractive to some dogs. And so they really want to run up and, and grab it and play with it um, or grab sticks that are wrapped in it. And uh, that's unfortunately probably what happened to the dogs that, uh, that passed away over the last couple of years. Sampling the water bodies around New Brunswick is, is, is hugely challenging. And this is why um, we're 
we've been limited in the past as a province to, to, to not having sort of a real-time monitoring system. We have over 200 lakes in the province and getting to them once is challenging, let alone trying to monitor them on a regular basis. Even for us as researchers, this is what we do, it can be really hard to take a sample, one bottle out of one lake at one point in time and feel that it's representative. But what, you know, what about the toxins on the other side? What if the wind blows in the other direction? What if they migrate? What if that clump flops by? And so we were looking for another method that wouldn't rely so much on people being able to identify a bloom or be, get to it at the right time or find a mat. And what other people have started doing elsewhere around the world is, is use, um, and not just for cyanotoxins, they've only been used two or three times for cyanotoxins, but they've been used for other compounds in water, is they deploy something called a solid phase absorption toxin tracking device, <laughs> SPAT, I'll call it. Basically, it's a little tea bag like this. It's a mesh bag that's got a resin in it, and that resin absorbs toxins. And so when the water flows over the tea bag, uh, any toxins in the water stick onto the resin, and you can pull that little bag out at the end of the season, analyze it for toxins, and know a little bit about everything that that bag has seen over the last whole season. So it allows us coverage on time and space that we simply can't do otherwise. So we did some test deployments in 2019 to see what would happen, to see if there were even enough toxins that we could detect anything. I uh, worked with a couple of watershed organizations to have some of these deployed around. And um, what we were able to do is partner with um, the, on, and, um, the on labs in Ontario that do their toxin testing. And they have analyzed the samples for us and determined the concentration of 10 of the variants of microcystins. There's about 280, but the really common ones are there's about 10. And the two major anatoxins that are a concern, uh, anatoxin and dihydroanatoxin. And we don't, so I don't have that data to share. It's not really mine to, to, um, to share around, but suffice to say that some spat collectors came back completely negative. There was nothing on them. Other ones had toxins and they've started to give us an idea then without so much um, effort where there are really concerning areas that need, need further study. And so the, the Gem St. Grand Lake Watershed Association is one of the groups that is working this coming year or this current year with ACAP St. John, um, who are leading a project to take a look at cyanotoxins in watersheds. I'm working with them as well. We're all um, basically a two-pronged approach. These SPAC collectors are being deployed in watersheds all along the Willistook, as well as their tributaries, to try to get a feel for um, how widespread the cyanotoxin issue might be. We had a 20 kilometer re region tested from the Mactaquack Dam down to the Carlton Park of, of Fredericton. And it was pretty much all positive. So we, but we have no idea if that extends north or south and what the implications might be. So these toxin collectors should gather a lot of data rapidly. They're also, while there's volunteers and samplers out there collecting, looking for these benthic mats to bring back in so we can test them as well and, and, and get a feel for what there is <clears throat> in our water bodies. So that's been a whole lot of information, but uh, to summarize, where really where are we going from here? Um, in terms of my lab and what we're continuing to work on, unfortunately, we had to drop the lake work we were doing because we just had too much work with the rivers. It turned out to be a good decision given the pandemic. Um, we're operating on a skeleton workforce right now with one person in the lab and can't handle many samples coming in. We're focusing instead because the river system was so unique and so different, we felt that we really needed to understand it better. And so what we're doing is um, not only detecting the anatoxin and their genes, but doing it quantitatively. So the SPAT collectors, we actually come up with an, an I get a number at the end and we, of how, many to, how much toxin has absorbed to them, and we know how long they were deployed, and we can get a feel for how much toxin a day each of those collectors is, is exposed to. 
I've also got a method developed in my lab for not only saying if the anatoxin gene is present or absent, but actually telling us exactly how many copies there are. Um, one of the most, the, the biggest drawbacks of the genetic method uh, screening method is simply that it, it just tells you if you've got a toxin gene or not, not if there's one copy or if there's a million copies. So we really felt it was important to get into quantitative analysis. We haven't got the microcystin um, quantitative assay working yet. We're working on that. Well, once we can get back in the lab, that is. Um, so in addition to the method development, we're expanding the survey of MATS and the Williston contributaries, and that's in collaboration with ACAP St. John and all of the watershed organizations they have working with them, and that includes deploying SPAC collectors. So if you come across any tea bags attached to rebar or other kinds of uh, mooring devices, please leave them be. Um, there are people very, very interested in seeing what kind of numbers come off of those at the end of the year. In addition, I think one of the really important things is, is a huge amount of education. There, were, there was so much press coverage about cyanobacteria, and yet there are so much misinformation out there. Um, I, I know from Department of Environment and Local Government, they're getting a huge number of calls about people worried about anything green along their, their shores or floating in their lakes. There is a really big difference between algae and cyanobacteria. And um, of course, you want to be cautious um, if you see something that looks different. Um, but any of the sort of aquatic plants, seaweeds, those are all completely fine and normal. Um, we are really looking for, uh, they're very distinct from cyanobacteria. So um, a number of groups are going out and doing uh, education, trying to help people understand what they're looking for specifically what mats look like and where you might find them. And so it's important to highlight this. Most of the literature that exists to date that you'll come across on the internet or, or anywhere talks about cyanobacteria blooms and they're in lakes and they're in stagnant water bodies and they're in places that are filled with nutrients. That's the case in lakes, but the Willistook River system is a completely different environment. Elsewhere where they see anatoxins, um, New Zealand has about 10 or 12 years of study ahead of us. The rivers that they're found in are pristine. They have no excess nutrients. They are high flow environments. They are not stagnant ponds. They don't have surface accumulations. They don't look anything like what people have been trained to look for, for cyanobacteria. So it's a really important part of getting the message out that we've got two very different systems lakes, surface blooms, mostly microcystins versus rivers, flowing environments not associated with high nutrients that we're aware of to date, anatoxins, and they're found on the bottom. So I, I'm trying to do my part in, in that um, in, and appreciate people coming out today to, to learn a little bit more about them, to help inform people about the risks associated with toxin exposure, that there are definitely risks out there of being in and around water um, for not only dogs, but also others that may ingest more water than, than your average um, swimmer. So people who don't swim as well, or young children who tend to put things in their mouths or aren't strong and therefore ingesting a lot, There's, these can be concerns for them. And the other thing about education is, uh, you know, is if trying to figure out ways to reduce the factors that encourage cyanobacteria growth. And this is why I spend so much time talking about what's different from cyanobac between cyanobacteria and algae. Cyanobacteria, unfortunately, given what's going on in the world with our climate, they love warm waters. And so it's a big challenge, but one of the best ways to discourage cyanobacteria from gaining a foothold is to keep the climate change down to a minimum and um, avoid uh, these lengthening seasons that we're seeing and increased elevated temperatures. It's a, it, it's a great environment for cyanobacteria. We're not sure what factors alter the growth of the benthic cyanobacteria. That part is very much open and up for discussion. Um, I had, have spoken with colleagues in New Zealand and California who have um, 
cyanobacteria proliferations in their rivers. And as I said, they're pristine. They don't have nutrient source input, like point source inputs. They have low nutrient loads. Um, so it doesn't look like limiting nutrients is such a big deal for the benthic mats, although um, there may be other factors. They're wondering if um, fine sediments might be, play a role, for example. In the rivers, absolutely, or sorry, in the lakes, absolutely phosphorus um, can be an issue. Nitrogen is such an issue for most of these because they can harvest nitrogen from the, from, from the air, as I said. So this is, a, this is really an important message, is um, doing what we can to uh, reduce the, the environments that encourage cyanobacteria, making sure that waters are um, left in pristine conditions. We can encourage riparian zones to be replanted if they've been removed along watersheds, because that helps strip nutrients from the water, groundwater before it runs into our, our water systems. It also provides shade along the shore and can, uh, if you've got a big, you know, shallow, exposed, wide rivers that don't have the, you know, the, the elms flowing over top, then those environments are going to be really, really good for cyanobacteria to grow in. So that's, that's basically where I wanted to go um, with the presentation. I do want to acknowledge a lot of the people, um, I hope I haven't missed anyone here, who really helped out with this work. So the National Research Council Biotoxin Group are doing a lot of the toxin tests for us. They're actively working on um, a number of fronts with the Wollaston River data. The Canadian Rivers Institute are so well equipped to do the sampling that we just don't do it anymore. My lab, we um, sit in the lab and get bottles delivered and baggies delivered and all, all sorts of things dropped off to the lab for extraction for genetic analysis. The government of New Brunswick, Department of Environment uh, and local government and provincial vet labs were absolutely instrumental in identifying the anatoxin issue in the river and continued to provide warnings to the New Brunswick residents about areas where there are uh, potentially toxic algae. Cyanobacteria, there I go. Uh, the Blue Green Algal Advisory. Um, grants from NSERC and also the New Brunswick Environmental Trust Fund has been a major source of funding for the research and has allowed us and permitted us to get working really quickly. Um, it's rare that you can turn around, have a, a, a dog death and a response to it. I think literally within weeks we were able to, to um, turn our research around and start looking. So it's been a huge help. So um, I'm going to finish up there and I'm going to take a look at some of the questions. Thanks so much for, for staying with me this long. So, um, and I'm not sure if Brad wants to jump on here too. Um, yes, I'm not sure how the video works. Yes, yeah, so if, um, if those who have joined us sort of a little late would look at the chat window and select the two option for all panelists and attendees and enter their name and affiliation. That would be much appreciated by uh, everyone present. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so if you wouldn't mind doing that, open the chat uh, window and, and enter your, your name and your affiliation, that would be great. Okay, Janice, back to you okay. answering some questions. Thanks, Brad. So one of the questions that's come in is bacteria affected by water chemistry, pHs and metals and organics, temperatures. Um, absolutely. Um, as I said um, just at the end there, we have a, a much better idea what affects the lake cyanobacteria. They've been studied for much longer. Um, and people are pretty confident in phosphates being a really, really big issue. Um, and those can come in, excess phosphates can come in from high phosphate or actually phosphate containing um, detergents of any sort. So from dish soaps to laundry detergents making their way into freshwater systems. They also can come in, any nutrients can come in from septic tanks that are overflowing. Another big source would be um, land runoff. So whether it's uh, agricultural or it's a golf course, anything that we put on our land to fertilize the grass flows off and fertilizes the, um, the water course that's around it. So 
those are issues for the stagnant lake systems. Um, I've been taking a look as I've been writing up the results here for the lake survey, I've been taking a look at the water quality indices for various lakes around the province. And I'm actually impressed that there aren't that many that are heavily impacted with nutrients yet. I say yet because elsewhere, we see a trend towards increasing nutrient impacts. Um, New Brunswick has a chance, I'm, and I'm hoping with this research to, we have a chance to make sure that we don't go down that pathway. Um, we, in a lot of cases, the lakes are very good nutrient, um, uh, low nutrient levels, they're not eutrophied. And now that we know that there are potentially toxic species there, if we want to keep them from blooming, keep them from becoming abundant and actually releasing significant toxins into the water, we definitely want to take a look at um, nutrient loads. Um, temperature, again, yes, they do tend to grow really well over a wider range of temperature than algae. So algae are sort of specialized for a narrower range. They are well adapted to the environment that we had up until maybe 10 years, 20 years ago. Um, and unfortunately with climate change, they're not able to adapt as rapidly as the average temperature is increasing. Uh, cyanobacteria have a wider temperature range naturally, and so while the algal counterparts, they normally sort of compete with one another and keep each other in check and balance, and the algae are sort of suffering and the cyanobacteria are kind of taking off. The second part of the question is, does it make a difference if the stagnant or fast, or if the water is stagnant or fast flowing? So that was the real shock to us with the Wollastook River toxicity. The dogma around cyanobacteria is that you get blooms in stagnant areas, not necessarily low oxygen. These guys evolve oxygen, so oxygen is often very high when they're present. But typically areas where there's not a lot of flow, the, the blooms accumulate because they don't flow away and get diluted by new water coming in. And so this is why lakes and ponds bloom with these surface blooms. What was surprising then is when we saw the Wollastook River, this flowing environment and toxins there, and, and now we know how they could accumulate, they're living attached to bodies. The water is flowing by and they're attached to rocks or attached to uh, aquatic plants and they can accumulate to a very high density without being flushed out of the system. And that was definitely a new one, new one for me. So I think that's, those are the major parts for that question. Thanks for that. Um, so a question here, uh, and I'm actually not sure about the answer. The question is, is Southern analysis sensitive enough to detect species identity? Um, a southern, I, I'm assuming that you're meaning a southern blot, and I might need to ask you to fill in this a little bit more. Um, can you use sequence, sequencing to identify who carries the anatoxin gene? Yes, you can use some sequencing. Um, and that's actually what we're doing now. Well, once the labs, the sequencing labs open up and get their backlog dealt with, the, the pandemic's really really slowed things down that way. But um, what we've done in some cases, we've been able to reconstruct the entire uh, genome of some of the producers and found out not only where that one toxin gene is, but where the other ones are and where they are in relation to one another and determine if they may have more than one copy. When we do quantitative assays, if we don't know how many copies of instruction the organism has, our numbers might not actually make sense in the end. So that's something that we've been, we've been working on. Um, what we do is a phylogenetic analysis afterwards then of the actual toxin gene. We're, we've done a number of them now. We do know the identity of the organism in the river. It's, they keep changing the names, um, but I think it's most commonly now going as microcoleus. Uh, for previously had been identified as a formidium, if you're familiar with the genera for, of cyanobacteria, and now it's considered a microcoleus. Um, there may be some other genera that are producing toxins. Um, we're going to go back and do a deeper sequencing analysis. Okay, so that was a detailed one. So um, some more general ones here. So 
The question is, in warmer climates, are cyanobacteria always problematic in fresh water in the past? So, that's a tough one to answer directly. I guess I'll, I'll pull on one piece of historical data that I came across. Cyanobacteria have certainly been around forever, including the toxic ones. Um, there was an interesting case study done in the eastern townships around Montreal. Um, people were concerned. They thought that an industry group may have introduced um, toxic cyanobacteria to their lake and because they were suddenly seeing problems. And they were wanting to know who sort of was responsible for it and how would they avoid this happening in the future. So what they did was actually obtain sediment cores from the bottom of the lake and using the cores look back over time to see when the toxin genes first arrived and they've been there for hundreds of years. So um, the toxin genes had always been there and I think that's um, a really another really important educational point to make is that these are probably not new events. In most cases, they, the organisms have probably always been here um, there may be a shift in the environment, certainly because of climate change and changing um, land use, increased um, urban areas, increased runoff, increased nutrients going into the water, for example. And that's shifting to make cyanobacteria more um, prolific in areas, but they had to have come from somewhere. And so they have probably always been around and always been providing, uh, always been producing toxins in some areas. Um, warmer climates, there are cyanobacteria reported elsewhere, um, but the cyanobacteria that would have been in warmer climates were adapted to warmer climates and sort of staying in check already because of the other warm adapted algae there. So it's a, it's a bit of a tricky question to answer that way. Um, I would suspect that they have always been a bit of a, they've always been around and they would have been a problem. The other thing that we're noticing, there's maybe an increase in the, um, in the environmental conditions that are really good for cyanobacteria to grow, but there's also increased reporting. There's, you know, the capability of people to be sitting all across the country listening to a webinar on cyanobacteria and becoming informed and linking, thinking, oh, my dog was sick or, oh, is that what I saw in the lake? Mm -hmm. So we have a greater chance of explaining things that we've seen, of reporting them, of linking them and understanding them. And that leads to increased reporting. Uh, and, and, and what you would think in the literature or from however you're gathering your data, you'd think that there's actually an increased incidence and there might not be quite so much an increased incidence. Um, the studies that I've looked at that have tried to disentangle, is it actually an increase in toxic cyanobacteria or is it an increase in reporting, have said it's a bit of both. They're increasing in severity and duration because the seasons are longer and warmer, um, but there's also more reporting happening. So we've got another question coming through here. Uh, is the volume of waters in rivers decreasing with increasing temperature? And does this increase, increase the concentration of cyanobacteria nutrients? So um, the volume of waters, I mean, if you're, I'm not sure where you're writing from, but if you're in New Brunswick and you saw the, our freshwater systems in June, they're really low and really warm. And uh, we're seeing already increased blooms uh, in the lakes. And I don't have data yet from the river to know. Um, I don't think that we can, can't really give a, a, a straight answer in terms of water flow in the river. That's main, because that's maintained by the dam. Um, there are strict um, measures that need to be kept in place of dam flow for electricity production. And the, the, the entire St. John River is subject to altered flows due to the dam. So um, that's, uh, yeah, a little harder to read into. Um, does the nutrient, does the decrease in water increase nutrient concentrations? We are, don't know. Um, there have been some people do some studies on nutrients in the river. I, I looked at them quickly and didn't see any correlation between the nutrient inflows and where cyanobacteria were present, but it's something we're actually looking at a little more deeply. 
Um, so could I sample Little Tobique in and outside Mount Carlton Park? So the Little Tobique River, um, I had been hoping to do the Tobique this year. Um, the Canadian Rivers Institute was, they're doing the north, the sampling from Fredericton all the way up to Edmonston. And we had hoped to get out and do some, um, maybe do some talks and collectors along the, uh, along the river. And oh, great. This is great. I'm getting, <laughs> it's hard to keep on top, but I see somebody else is writing in here saying that you're monitoring locations on the Toby with the YSA Pro and Hobo. So you've already got mooring sites. Um, yeah, I would love to get uh, some SPAC collectors on the Tobique as well. I'll have to double check with ACAP. They kind of have the agreement with Ontario for how many samples we're allowed to submit each year. And we had sort of an, a, an agreed number, but I can check with them to see if we can add a couple of more samples um, from the Tobique. That would be great. The nice thing about the tea bags is they are totally innocuous. You just keep them in the fridge, you throw them in the river, and then you hold, you can throw them in the freezer until they get back to us for analysis. So please re reach out to me if I could ask uh, Frank and or Lou, or Lee Reed, um, maybe by email if you could. Um, I should be pretty easy to find you in, at UNB, J-L-A-W-R-E-N-C at UNB.ca. And we'll, we'll chat about that. Thank you. Okay, so has there been any research or consideration to if, oh, this just jumped, sorry. Uh, the screens are odd here. If there is a purpose or benefit of develop the development of cyanobacteria on its environment. Um, benefits, yeah. So cyanobacteria, every organism in the, in my mind, every organism in the environment has an important role. I, they, they aren't there if they're not fulfilling something. Um, we, you know, you can even see from the way we call the toxins, they're hepato or derma. We just think about ourselves and how, what impact they have on us. Um, but they are going to be fulfilling important roles, like continuing to evolve oxygen, um, absorbing some of the nutrients that we release, um, that sort of thing. So I would, I would just generally say the environment that, that cyanobacteria have an important role to play. Um, And it would be good if we could avoid sh rapidly shifting the environment that caused them to sort of really go heavily and out of balance. I hope I've answered yep. that one okay. Yeah, that's could I interrupt just for a second? Uh, Absolutely. If any attendees are still here that haven't entered their name in mm. the chat window, I would appreciate that. Uh, you have to change your, your to button from panelists to all panelists and attendees. So if you would do that, if you haven't yet entered your name, that would be much appreciated by everybody here. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, please go ahead, Janice. No, oh, thanks, thanks. I'm not sure if you want to stop sharing your screen. It might be, uh, okay. give a little bigger picture of the, the of you and... Uh, oh, okay, yeah, I can't see what, I, what you're seeing at all, so <laughs> let's see. Okay, there we go. Is that better? Yeah, that's great. Okay, because I can't see it at all. <laughs> this, this is actually, I'm really glad to have this chance. I have to lecture all fall and it's kind of nice to get a feel for what it's going to be like to sit in the spare bedroom and talk to people. <laughs> okay, yeah, so, I'm sorry, okay. I interrupted you, please. <laughs> so another question here, can one genus of cyanobacteria produce more than one type of toxin? Oh, good question. Yeah, unfortunately they can. And if so, would they do some at the same time or different times and conditions? We don't know yet if they would do it at the same time or different conditions, um, but I, I would assume, certainly, okay, the way we name species, we've got a genus, which is kind of like the last name of a big family, and then there's a species, that's kind of like your first name. Within a genus, you can find the genus Anabaena, I think you find every toxin under the sun produced by some species of that genus. Whether or not you find a species 
or an individual cell even within that species because toxicity doesn't align with species. Do we have an individual cell producing toxins, different toxins at the same time? I would have to get yes. Um, I would have to guess that there would be yes, producing it more times. Um, and under different conditions, that's, that's another good question is whether or not uh, certain conditions favor one toxin and other conditions favor another toxin. We don't know enough about that end of things. Those are really challenging lab experiments to run. And we run into some problems when we try to culture large batches of very toxic stuff, <laughs> um, policy-wise. Um, pulling things in from the environment is a little easier to do than grow really toxic stuff in, in, a, in a lab. So. Um, so a follow-up to one of the earlier questions on the benefits of cyanobacteria and what are their benefits. Are we already thought as we are already talking about trying to avoid its production, we don't understand its impact entirely. Right, okay, so, and, and I certainly uh, would be the last person to suggest that we should avoid, get rid, and, and, and get rid of all cyanobacteria altogether. More the point is that, um, until we started having such a heavy impact on our environment, things were in an, a good balance and we didn't see one species dominate quite as often as it does now. So my thinking in terms of trying to reduce cyanobacterial blooms is not to get rid of them altogether, but to say that if they're there, if they're more frequent and more long lasting and more severe, because we have fertilized the lake, and because we are increasing the global temperatures and we are there for um, inhibiting the growth of algae to grow, then I think that is something we want to consider. Um, cyanobacteria, everything sort of has a place in its environment. And one of the reasons cyanobacteria may be growing really well is because we are damaging the other organisms that normally grow really well. Um, so it's sort of a protectionist or conservation of, of the algae and all of the huge diversity of species that should be in our freshwater environments and avoiding them, those environments getting dominated by one species of cyanobacteria. And that's what a bloom is. So typically if you go to a lake, grab a bottle of water and take a look under a microscope, you're going to just see so many different things under there. What happens during a cyanobacteria bloom is that one species or two or three outstrip everything else. You look under the microscope, I brought a sample back from what was supposed to be my vacation. I, yes, I went out and sampled cyanobacteria and it was, I only saw one cell type in a liter, one cell type. That's not a balanced system. Um, yes, there's gonna be some cases, conditions that that happens on occasion, but when we see that happening more frequently, and more severely and it lasting for longer, it's a good indicator that we've thrown the system out of balance, that the things that, that the diversity of things that should be there, feeding various organisms aren't missing. That's a bit of a scary thought. Um, cyanobacteria aren't terribly good food. One of the reasons they accumulate to bloom levels is because other things don't eat them. Other organisms, you never see thick green algae on the surface of your lakes because every time a cell divides and makes a new cell, a little larva comes and eats the new cell. So they don't ever accumulate to huge abundances. One of the reasons cyanobacteria accumulate is nobody wants to eat them. They're not a, not a terribly good um, food web source. Um, lost my cursor here, this is early, there we go, okay. So does the toxin stay within the cyanobacteria cells or can it be released? Excellent question, Eric. Um, it depends on the toxin we're talking about. With microcystins, um, they are the cells they're produced in and, and the type of toxin can leak out of the cells um, quite readily. I believe at least 80% of the toxins are maintained inside the cell when the cell is living. The thing about an environment that produces a bloom is that eventually whatever it is that's allowing that abundance of cells to take off and grow runs out. They either run out of sunlight because they've shaded each other or they've stripped the water of nutrients. Something gives away and the cells die rapidly. When they die, they release all their toxins. And so um, 
that's the other concern about using mechanisms like methods for detecting toxic cyanobacteria by measuring the toxins in the water. If you're only measuring in the water, you're waiting until things have been released. I mean, generally the methods actually involve collecting it from the cells as well. But yes, they do, um, they are released. I believe less is known about the anatoxin and whether or not that is released. It, some of it is, and I think the reports I've seen are that at least, at least 10% of the cell toxin volume is leaked out and then it is all leaked out when the cells die. You know, any of these pictures that you've seen, you know, consider the lake you live on um, in the winter. None of those cells are there, those toxins have been released. One of the things about the two different toxins we're talking about, and another reason to keep them separate, is that microcystins, the liver toxin, they have an extremely long uh, life in the water. They are not degraded by UV, by heat, by um, basically anything. And so those toxins end up in the water. They adsorb to not just my toxin bags, but also to sediments. They end up in the bottom of the lakes and they can be stirred up as the lakes go through their annual cycling. So microcystins can actually come out if you do of the bottom of the sediments when you do dredging, when you're putting in you know, moorings, that sort of thing and be released. Um, the cells themselves, some of them don't die and release. They also form kind of overwintering seed cells and they go to the bottom. We don't know if those have toxins in them, but certainly the sediments do. Anatoxins, on the other hand, the toxin is actually quite um, susceptible to degradation. Um, and so it doesn't accumulate so much in the environment. We don't know yet but we don't think you would find it in the sediments of the river system for example um, but it is rapidly degraded by uv and of course the sediments don't get a lot of uv but i think it's degraded by other means as well and so you won't see anatoxins accumulate to the same level in the environment and they won't accumulate over multiple years the way you would see in a lake system with microcystins Okay, so uh, next question is that, um, so my focus is mostly on the river. Can I point you to someone that's following lakes that tested positive for the presence of genes indicating uh, anatoxin A or microcystin? So to my understanding, um, I don't know of anyone that's following up on the lakes this year that tested positive for anatoxin or microcystin. They are all still on the advisory list um, or any, the, any lakes that were on the advisory list before I started doing my work are still on the advisory list. And those ad advisories are stay there forever because the organisms can go to the bottom and then rebloom every year or not even bloom, but just become present again in the plankton. Um, so there is, um, to date, unfortunately, there's just not enough manpower to, to continue following the lakes. I would, I would love to, but um, not possible, unfortunately. So one of the things that I have been wondering about, and one of the reasons I developed the methods was not because, I, as a research lab, I can't do routine analyses. I have a mandate to, to sort of push the envelope and develop new methods but I really hope to hand the methods to someone. And so uh, the methods are, I happily collaborate with any group who want to um, start monitoring and using genetic techniques. They're not easy to implement, and more importantly, they're not easy to interpret. I'm happy to help doing that if there's a group that um, can come up with a mechanism for doing the analysis. The lab in Fredericton that I'm aware of that does a lot of routine testing of for other water, um, like chemistry, for example, would be RPC. And uh, I'm really hoping, I don't know if, I don't know if it would fit in their business model. I don't know if there's enough samples that would be collected and how much it would actually cost someone like RPC to run the samples and how much people would be willing to pay. But those are some in interesting questions that, um, that I'd be happy to explore with a group if they, if they want to sort of take up the charge. Unfortunately, that's sort of outside of my the mandate of my, my position at the university, but um, I can certainly work with people on that. So a question, are there organisms that eat cyanobacteria? Um, there, there are some, but as I said before, uh, they're not really good food is, is sort of the consensus. Um, 
so if given there are some organisms larvae and small zooplankton that will eat them but usually if given another option they will choose the other option um, we there are reports of cyanotoxins accumulating in the food web and so um, one of the important messages too for people who live on water bodies where there are cyanotoxins is to make sure that you really are careful with any fish that you take in from there i wouldn't eat any of the innards because that like any of you know make sure they're cleaned really well um, remove all of the the organs you wouldn't want to eat the liver you wouldn't want to eat any of the any of the internal organs because they could have accumulated toxins significantly um, depending on the particular fish type and the particular toxin you're talking about, there are a number of studies out there um, that will help identify what load, toxin load there may be in certain fish. But um, I haven't had a chance really to look at, at, at um, the fish species in all the water bodies that I've been looking at in New Brunswick yet. Um, but there's, there are some, some resources out there that you could take a look at. Uh, do they accumulate, bioaccumulate? Yes, so that's sort of a term that's used to describe, you know, a single cell has a certain toxin load, but another organism that eats a million of those cells accumulates a million times and then they pass it to the next organism. And, and I believe they do. Um, I, in the river system, I'm not too familiar with bottom feeding fish that would eat cyanobacteria, but there are bottom feeding fish that would eat other aquatic plants and they could inadvertently ingest cyanobacteria even. And um, there, there could be toxin buildup in some of their tissues as well. So, and it looks like that is the last of the questions. I think I've finished them all. Uh, Brad, do you? Yes. Got any others coming uh, in there? There were a few questions that were uh, sent to you earlier about whether mm -hmm. cyanobacteria will cling to boats. Ah, uh, right, thank you. Transferable to I another water to, body. I yeah. did mean to bring that up. So yeah, the, the whole movement of clean, drain, dry is super important because cyanobacteria are gonna to attach to anything and they're gonna travel on anything that goes with them. And they're so small, you don't notice them. So yes, you can move cyanobacteria from lake to lake, from river to lake, from lake to river on your boat on your boots. I had a really scary experience one day. I was sampling, I, I had a CBC team, they were doing a video along the river and I was like, oh, this, you know, I had my gloves on, I had my boots on, I put everything on and was really careful. And then I got in my car to drive home and a big chunk of toxic cyanobacteria mat fell off onto the mats in my car. I have a dog. Uh, and that thing is emitting odors that attract dogs. If I hadn't noticed it and cleaned the mats on my car, I would have possibly killed my dog. Um, it's a really sticky mat that, so yeah, your boots, your anything can, can carry it. But definitely because people like to move their aquatic, their, their wreck vehicles back and forth, uh, clean, drain, dry, you need to make sure that uh, the, the, your bilge tanks, whatever, make sure that they're, you're not moving cyanobacteria from one lake to the next. Um, we're not the only organisms that will be moving them. One of the reasons that I, you know, the, the stat I put up earlier, nine out of the 11 lakes that I looked at had cyanobacteria in them. Well, they're all in the same environment. They're, some of them are attached through the watershed and there are birds that fly between all of these lakes. And there are all sorts of algae and cyanobacteria that are in their feathers and on their legs and getting moved from one environment to another. So, so I think we also have to be a little careful that we're, you know, we don't want to encourage or to, you know, dump large loads, but we're certainly not the only uh, vector, we call them, vector of transport that we are going to move organisms from one freshwater body to another. So that was that was a, a really good question. I'm sorry I hadn't thought of that one earlier. I'm kind of, yeah. I think the other questions were mostly about um, 
nutrients into the river, for example, and are nutrient stimulating the benthic mats that produce anatoxins. And, and so far to date, for the other areas that have benthic river cyanobacteria, nutrients aren't the factor. Um, so the good question now is then what is? <laughs> um, my suspicion, um, just from the quick data that we're getting from the field teams that are traveling the river, it looks like these mats, at least visible mats, are present at different points in the river. And, and even just how abundant they were in that 20 kilometer range, they didn't just show up yesterday. They could not have covered that expanse of area um, very recently. I suspect that they've been there for a while. It's only recently that people had the mechanism to test for anatoxins. It's only recently that we've had the internet so that people say, hey, you know, maybe you should think about this. Um, 50 years ago, if someone's dog died after playing on the river, I think it's really unlikely that they would have sent it out for necropsy. And if it had gone to necropsy, that the vet would recognize that it could be a cyanotoxin and then there weren't even assays available yet. So um, we're, we're learning um, more information, but I don't think it's a new, a new phenomenon in the river for sure. Well, uh, I think we will wrap it up there. Thank you very, very much, Janice, for an excellent presentation. I see a You're lot welcome. of good comments in the chats and also in the Q&A session that was okay. very good. And lots of luck in your ongoing research. I Thanks so much, Brad. Yeah, really appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And have a good night, everyone. Yes. Thank you very much. Bye. Yeah. Bye-bye.